So, we will take couple of questions here, maybe 3, 4 questions from various. Over to Mufakkam Ja College, Hyderabad. Uh, actually, my, there are a couple of questions. The first question goes in this way, ki, when I take the oil industry in specific, the order goes in this way, the gas, first is gas, the next one is oil and the third one is water. So, as it is clear, the, in the convection, the velocity decreases as we go down. So, when the velocity decreases, when we do a well uh, to take out the crude oil, how come the oil comes so easily when there is a uh, velocity decrease? This is my first question. Okay. The question is little not, it is little more application oriented. So, all that I would, the question is, there is oil moving over which air is moving and perhaps some other fluid, question is not very audible. Nevertheless, there are multiple fluids flowing and now how do I handle the heat transfer coefficient or the friction factor in this sort of situation. In fact, I had answered similar question in on Friday, I said that the shear stress or the temperature gradient on the side where the oil is there is quite different from on the side where the air is there. That is number 1. And number 2, there is going to be interfacial shear stress. That is, wherever there is an interface between oil and air, there is an interface. So, there is an interfacial shear stress and also temperature gradient. Okay. So, I know I have not completely answered, but the fundamentals what we have taught here is only for single fluid. We are not handling two phase flow. This comes under two phase flow. Maybe we will touch and go when we touch boiling. But I would not say that we will be touching two phase flow, here we are interested in single phase flow. I would like to take next question. Yeah, next question is, uh, when the oil is, has come out from the well and it is sent to the uh, refinery through the flow lines. So, at the initial pressure, for example, it is P1, assume that it is uh, somewhere around 20 bar and at the exit, which is a P2 is less than the P1. Now, my question over here is, when the flow is steady flow and how come there is a change in velocity when the corrosion layer is there in the flow line? Okay. Okay. The question is, I am supplying the flow from high pressure 20 bar to, to, to almost atmospheric pressure where I am supplying. The question is, how come this velocity? How come this pressure decreases even in the steady flow? Professor, you will have to wait for internal flow, but I can tell very easily that frictional losses will account for this pressure drop. That is all it is. But still, we you will understand much clearly when we handle this in internal flow. All that I can say for now is that frictional losses would compensate or are the culprits which create this pressure drop. Of course, 20 bar is too high. Maybe 20 bar is required. What is the length? Well, if I, depending on the length, if it is running for few kilometers, yes, because it is going through valves, bends, straight pipes. So, you have major losses, minor losses, all put together, maybe it will contribute to 20 bar. Is that okay, Professor? Uh, if, if I want to have a steady flow without decreasing the velocity, what I want to do is, I want to remove the corrosion because the oil contains more and more amount of sulphur. So, it corrodes the pipe so easily and the thickness of the pipes get reduces. So, what I want to do, when I have to remove the corrosion, simultaneously the velocity should not decrease and simultaneously I have, to, I, have I am sure that I should maintain the same uh, Reynolds number. See, we are asking for something, the question asked is, one of our participant is very enthusiastic to remove corrosion and he says that he wants to utilize high velocity and remove the corrosion. So, what he says is that when the corrosion takes place in the pipe, it sediments. Essentially, what is happening here is the area decreases, but he does not want to decrease, increase the velocity wherever the area decreases there, but that is not possible. It is, it, if corrosion takes place, it is going to decrease the cross sectional area I have to satisfy continuity equation. So, my rho and A is, my rho is fixed because if it is oil and A area is decreasing, there is no other option but for the velocity to increase locally. So, sorry, we cannot, we cannot 
avoid corrosion. Corrosion is part of our life. Okay. I have been told that in one of the power plants, in steam power plants, when they installed a steam power plant, they had, they had, they, let us say they were generating one, 1 megawatt, but after 5 years, there was a decrease in power by almost 10 percent because of the frictional losses, because of corrosion. Okay, next question. Uh, which is depend on, which is not depend on Q and T, T S minus T infinity. It will find temperature difference in force conversion. It is showing for free conversion. Okay. See, this is what we are always, T S minus T infinity we are using in forced convection. What do we do with free convection? Let us cross the bridge when we reach the bridge. We have not reached the bridge yet. Okay. Free convection is out of scope now. Next question, please. We have done averaging for and the continuity equation and momentum equation and the same averaging technique can apply for energy equation. Yes. I think the question was we have done some kind of averaging for continuity and momentum equation is the same kind of averaging applicable for energy equation. Am I right? Yeah, it is, defi it is definitely valid. So, in fact, that is how when turbulence was introduced, uh, you had u prime v prime bar. Here now you will have u prime t prime bar, v prime t prime bar, so on and so, that, so forth. In fact, that we are just going to up, uh, show that slide to you, where turbulence is taken care in the energy equation. Just yeah, there, yeah, here the heat transfer rate is there. Rho C P V prime T prime bar. That term, that is essentially the transfer transfer of energy because of the fluctuation of temperature coupled with the fluctuation of the velocity and that k t we will we will give that as we want to write it in terms of a derivative. So, we will call that minus k t d t bar by d y and this minus k t essentially is not a thermal conductivity, it is not a material property, it is not the fluid property, it is encompassing the fluctuations associated with the velocity and the temperature. So, that is therm, uh, it is called as turbulent thermal conductivity that is all. Okay. So, I would go one step ahead and say we have not Reynolds averaged the energy equation. Why do not you take that as a homework and average it out? Not why only V prime T prime bar, we will get U prime T prime bar also. It depends on situation to situation whether U prime T prime bar is significant or V prime T prime bar is significant. Just to give the feel that V prime T prime bar is the one which overtakes over K del T by del Y that we have given this. Like we said laminar shear stress is mu del u by del y, here also laminar heat conduction we can say that it is minus k del t by uh, minus k del t by del y and turbulent conduction is rho C p v prime t prime. Similar to what we did for turbulent shear stress minus rho u prime v prime bar. Okay? Sorry, conviction to slide number 50 please. Sir, can you explain the simplification process? One of the participants wants, how did I simplify in this transparency? Okay, what are we doing here? Let me first do the bottom one and then do the top one because now it does not matter in which order I go. So, del u v bar, what is u? u bar plus u prime into v, v bar plus v prime whole bar. That is this gradient has to be differentiated, but we know that I do not have to differentiate the gradient because we have already showed that del u v bar by del y or del u v by del y whole bar is equal to del u v bar by del y. I have already shown that from one of the relations. So, what do I get that? So, this is u bar into v bar that will be there, u prime v prime bar that will be there, but u, u bar v prime plus v bar u prime. If I am averaging, what will happen to u bar? u bar will come out. So, if I am averaging v prime bar, we have shown already that averaging, time averaging a fluctuating component that is whether it is u or v, u prime bar is going to give me 0. So, I get, I get this is 0 essentially because it is u bar into v prime bar v prime bar is 0. So, this term becomes 0. Similarly, here 
v bar into u pra, u prime bar which is again zero so that is why these two terms become zero is if this is understood the top thing also you should be you should have understood is that okay professor yes sir top one sir do u bar square by do x equal to 2 u bar do u by do x you wrote sir that i am not able to understand okay okay no problem one of the participants question is how did i get this 2 u bar del u bar by del x if i differentiate x squared what do i get 2 x so, but then u bar again is a function of x. So, I get 2 u bar del u bar by del x, that is all it is. Is that okay, Prasa? Over to Amrita for questions. Sir, uh, this is regarding the universal velocity profiles. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. go ahead. So, this is regarding the universal velocity profile for turbulent flows. So, there uh, you have uh, non dimensionalized velocity and y with uh, yeah. u tau, yeah. and that requires wall shear stress to be me measured. Sir, how do you measure this wall shear stress? Sir? Okay. Is, okay. And one more thing is it a constant, first of all, or okay. is t tau w a constant? Or if it is not a constant, then how is it obtained okay. at each layer? So, one of the questions is very good question. Professor Vivek is asking us that in the universal velocity profile, in the universal velocity profile we are writing u plus as u by u tau and u tau is square root of tau wall by rho. Now, how does one measure this tau wall? So, what did we say is that in the boundary layer let us say over a flow over a flat plate, I have u infinity. So, what did we say initially we have laminar sub layer, in the laminar sub layer in the laminar sub layer what is tau wall? Tau wall equal to mu del u by del y. This is flow over a flat plate there is no del v by del x because v equal to 0. So, del u by del y how do I get del u by del y? I can put a small probe very difficult, but there are some small probes which you can insert and measure, but very difficult to measure within the laminar sub layer. So, what people do is people take hot wire anemometer which I had told in the last class to for measuring the turbulent stresses. People take small hot wire anemometers, go as close to the wall as possible and measure this velocity gradient or if you cannot go as close, what do you do? You scale up the setup, you scale up the setup such that for y plus equal to 5, my y is almost of the order of 5 to 6 mm. Then you can take a small pitot probe and put the pitot probe and traverse the pitot probe, traverse the pitot probe near the wall and get the velocity gradient. That answers for laminar sub layer. Now I have to go to turbulent boundary layer and buffer layer. Let me go to turbulent boundary layer. In turbulent boundary layer life is easy. Turbulent boundary layer why life is easy I say because you can take the probe. So, but then definitely you cannot measure with simple pitot probe, I will answer that little later why I cannot measure turbulent stress with simple pitot probe. Hot wire anemometer as I said it is having less thermal inertia, so it can capture the velocity fluctuations. So, I will measure at every location u versus time and v versus time. So, I get u prime and v prime at every instant of time and then I will multiply that u prime and v prime and time average that I will be getting u prime v prime. So, this is how one can measure either with hot wire anemometer and of course, I do not want to get into laser Doppler velocimetry or particle image velocimetry it gets little complicated because I have already explained how hot wire anemometer works. This is how one measures u prime v prime and that is how one measures the shear stress no matter whether I am in laminar sub layer or in turbulent boundary layer. If these two are covered, I have covered buffer layer as well. Is that okay Vivek? Is it constant or not? Huh. Your next question was? Is it going to be constant? Yes sir, because what happens is in order to identify the three layers, you require y plus, which again requires tau w. Have... Yeah, yeah, the question is again Professor Vivek is asking us the question that 
for identifying y plus, you have to identify u tau. Yes, you have to identify. If I have measured shear stress, if I have measured shear stress, what do I get? I have got the shear stress. I can get u plus. That means, if I have measured shear stress, means I have got u also. I have measured shear stress and I have measured y as a function of y. Is that okay? We have got shear stress and velocity as a function of y. What is u plus? u plus is u by u tau, where u tau is square root of tau wall by rho. Is that right? So, now what is y plus? y plus is y u tau by nu. So, I have already got u tau, so I can get u plus y plus. Now, to answer the question, how do I identify? When I am putting my hot wire anemometer and I am putting my hot wire anemometer, I am in laminar sublayer, there will be no u prime, v prime, they will be very less. Once in my layer, u prime and v prime become significant, then very well I know that I am in turbulent boundary layer. Now, I do not even have to know. Now, because I even if I do not know this, if I plot the shear stresses the way I have measured in terms of either the velocity gradient or the turbulent shear stresses, if I plot them, I can identify u plus and y plus. And to answer your next question, are they going to be constant? No, they cannot be constant the shear stress is going to vary with y, no matter whether I am in buffer layer, it is going to vary with x also and it is going to vary with y also. You want to ask any further question, you please go ahead. Okay. Any other question from Amrita? Sir, one more question. Uh, on Friday, one of the professor was uh, uh, asking you about how we can uh, change the boundary layer problem. So, you, you and the professor Arun was telling that if you have in case of fixed flat plate, you drill a hole either and by with the help of suction or a blowing, you can affect the uh, boundary layer problem. But in case of that, uh, your u infinity or free stream velocity will also vary. Again, free stream velocity uh, will have an effect on the boundary layer also. Suppose if we take uh, a open circuit wind tunnel where uh, the closed uh, test section we can take into consideration, where, which each section, each side will act as a, if you take a square section, each side will act as a free stream velocity. If I am <coughs> going to drill a hole at the edge of the wall, it will again create a, my flow will not be a laminar. I, I suppose I never tested it uh, drilling a hole into my test section. The U infinity will vary and again the U infinity will have an effect on the boundary layer. So, how much far we can suggest that, uh, I uh, am not sure, I just no, want okay. to know. See, one of the participants question is that, for playing with the boundary layer, uh, we had suggested that on the other day, we had suggested that we will take, we will, we will either, on that day we had told that, we have a flat plate, we have a flat plate and there is u infinity, there is u infinity and we, if we drill holes, we will either suck or blow and that is how I can control the boundary layer. Now, one of our professor is having, is skeptical about this idea and he thinks that this is not practically possible for the simple fact that my u infinity is going to change all over the place. Now, first of all, I would like to answer for this question that this suction and blowing is very much in the real life application. Before I come to how to operate this in wind tunnel, I will come to that little later for you specific to the wind tunnel, but in real life this is very much an application. Where it is an application at least the place where I know it is film cooling. What is film cooling? If I take a gas turbine blade, if I take a gas turbine blade and this is my convection passages that is through each of these passages perpendicular to this board flow is taking place. What do they do? To keep they, they drill hole, there is remember there is flow here, there is flow taking place over the blade and of course, my blade is rotating, that is a different thing. For a minute, let us take this blade as stationary, no issues. Now, if I drill a hole from here, what is happening? What is happening when I drill a hole? It is, there is air blown, blown out and there is a small film forming all over my blade. Why? So that I keep my blade protected. Remember this air which is jetting into the jetting outside or getting out of the blade 
is actually playing or meddling with the boundary layer here, both thermal and hydrodynamic, both thermal and hydrodynamic and it is forming a film. So, it is not this suggestion of controlling the boundary layer is not out of the world is very much applied. If you cannot feel this film cooling, I give this example very generally, all of us when we take out potato from cooker, how do we cool it, how do we peel off the potato? This is what I used to do whenever I used to help my mother. She used to ask me to put below the tap. I just open the tap slightly and put it below the tap and so that my hand does not feel the hot temperature of the potato. Why? Because the tap water flow which is falling on my potato forms a boundary layer, forms a film and that is what is protecting my skin. So, essentially that is what here is we are doing. There is a film being formed. Now, coming to your second question, of course, you never drilled in your wind tunnel that says that you have experience in wind tunnel. So, now I can assume that and answer that yes, u infinity also has to be measured every location wherever you have drilled the hole. u infinity is not going to be the same. So, and I have to have how the u infinity varies also. So, it is going to be a messy affair nevertheless. In fact, if you see Professor Yuan's textbook for suction and blowing for flow over a flat plate, for laminar boundary layer, you have closed form solutions. You have closed form solutions. If you cannot get this U1, if you are interested to get this closed form solutions, put this question in Moodle, we will get back to you with the solutions. But the summary, sum and substance of all this discussion is that suction and blowing is very much of very much a solution and we do play with this in most of the heat transfer applications over to Anna universities for questions. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. In Reynolds equation, which term is negligible for high, com, uh, high speed flow or which term is predominant? One of the questions asked by one of the participants is that, see in Reynolds averaging, luckily I am here only, in Reynolds averaging, which of the terms are negligible for incompressible flows? Uh, or which of the terms are important for compressible flows. If you see here carefully, if you see here carefully, I have not Reynolds averaged density also. I have to, if density variations are important, I should have, I should have written density also, that is density also as rho bar plus rho prime. I have not done this, I have not done this. The very fact that I have not done this itself means that whatever Reynolds averaging I have done is it, it is for incompressible flows only. So, so if I have incompressible flows, then I have to take the density variation also. Then in that case, if you see, if you carefully see what is the continuity equation I have taken? I have taken del u by del x plus del v by del y plus del w by del z. The very fact that I have taken the continuity equation as this means that I have taken compressible flow. Incompressible flow, it is not compressible flow. Ma'am, I would request you to take the compressible flow equations because momentum equations nothing is going to change, only the continuity equation is going to change, the density variations will come into picture. So, that is all, that is I will have d rho by d t and in d rho by d t, that is the total derivative, remember in the total derivative, I will have density fluctuations. So, my equations is going, my equation is going to be quite lengthy and it is quite difficult to characterize in a uh, compressible flow all the turbulent fluctuations capturing density, because density means what? No sensor is there which will give me the density directly. I will have to measure the pressure fluctuations, I will have to measure the temperature fluctuations. Temperature fluctuations it is quite easy to measure with a simple thermocouple, of course it is not straightforward because you have to have a thermocouple as small as 25 micrometers, telling is very easy. As I told on the other day, 75 micrometer is my hair diameter. If I take a thermocouple, I have to have a bead of thermocouple bead of 25 micrometer. The question now is pressure. Pressure measurement is going to be very difficult because transducers come very fast. In fact, I skipped this question what professor asked, professor Vivek had asked, how, why I cannot measure with pitot tube. I cannot measure with pitot tube the pressure fluctuations because whatever pressure I measure, I have to take it through a tube and take it into my pressure transducer. Pressure transducer will be fast, but all my pressure fluctuations will get dampened out in my tube. 
So, my pressure tube or the tube through which my pressure fluctuations are being captured is quite difficult. To put it very simple way, capturing density fluctuations experimentally is quite difficult, but there are always, we cannot just say that they are difficult and do away with it or put it, put them under the carpet. We do some, take larger tubes and take faster sensors and take smaller length of the tubes and try to measure these pressure fluctuations, but these pressure fluctuations cannot be typically faster than 100 hertz. That is, that is the typical, typical sense, uh, typical way we circumvent these density fluctuations. Is that okay ma'am? NIT Trichy, any questions? So, when we refer uh, Reynolds analogy in textbooks, the conditions uh, provided are Prandtl's number uh, equal to 1 and uh, the form drag is negligible or 0. So, uh, what is the reason for the second condition? Okay. The question asked by one of the professors is that, he says that, huh? no, what he says is, he says that the, in the textbooks for the Reynolds analogy to be valid, Prandtl number should be equal to 1 and form drag should be equal to 0. Yeah. See, form drag means actually it is the pressure gradient. Drag is of two types. One is pressure drag and pressure drag, sorry, I am very impatient. Drag is, drag is equal to pressure drag plus viscous drag. See, before coming to this drag, let us take your first question. Prandtl number equal to 1. See, professor has already told us, professor has already told us that these equations will look similar only when the momentum and the energy equation. If we see, if we see these two equations, it is quite, from this equation itself one can tell. If we see these equations, when these two equations look similar, when or maybe instead of this, maybe we can take these two equations let us take. This is the best two form, non-dimensional form. This is momentum equation and this is energy equation. When will these two equations be same? When d p by d x is 0, when d p by d x is 0 and another one is when Prandtl number equal to 1. So, let, if, let me come back. If Prandtl number equal to 1, what will happen? This looks 1 by R e L del squared u star by del y star, del y star squared. And this also becomes 1 by R e L del square t star by del y star square. That answers your first part of the question, why Prandtl number should be equal to 1? Because the momentum equation and the energy equation form will be same. Now, another thing, what is not there in the energy equation is dp star by d x star square. dp star by d x star equal to 0 means what? There should not be pressure variation. That is what is, that is what is meant by pressure drag or form drag. That means, there should not be any pressure variation. If you take for example, I will in the next class, I am going to tell under what conditions this pressure drag is going to be 0. That is, only for flow or a flat plate pressure drag is 0. If you take for a, for example, flow around a cylinder, it is not equal to 0. So, flow around a cylinder, we cannot apply Reynolds analogy. For flow over a flat plate, we can apply Reynolds analogy. So, so this is what, this is the answer for your question, Professor. Okay. So, let us go to Shirpur, R.C. Patel, Shirpur. Good afternoon, sir. So, my question is that in case of, in case of uh, thermal boundary layer, if we are going to consider boundary layer theory, in case of aircraft, is this theory is applicable and how? Good. See, one of the questions by one of the participants is that we are assuming steady flow, whether it is thermal boundary layer, participant actually is asking for thermal boundary layer, he is asking whether the steady flow, whatever we are assuming, if I take an aircraft, it is valid. Yes. Let us see how does the aircraft reach steady state. Whenever it takes off, I am talking about a domestic aircraft, I am not talking about a fighter aircraft. If I take a domestic aircraft, if I take velocity versus time, 
when it takes off, it picks up, when it takes off, we all have experienced today, we have experienced that when it takes off, actually it, it accelerates like anything and we are very uncomfortable, because we get affected physiologically. So, it takes off and it picks up the velocity and typically, it reaches around 700 to 800 km pH, which is a Mach number of around 0.4 or 0.5 and that is where it stays. And while again touching down, what is that called? Landing, while landing again the velocity decreases. During cruising, during cruising in the air, during cruising in the air, it is steady state. The boundary layers in the uh, on the wing, on the wing during cruising is steady state. So, whether it is thermal or hydraulic, yes, there are also hydrodynamic thermal boundary layer is there. Remember, the temperatures there are minus 20 degree Celsius. I do not know if you have watched while traveling, there are temperatures and pressures given. Pressure is very low compared to atmospheric and temperature is minus 20, but my plate temperature is very high. So, maybe after some time it will reach steady state, but in terms of temperature, but there is temperature gradient. The point here is during cruising, it would reach steady state. Is that okay? NIT Calicut, you have any questions? We have used for non dimensionalization x star equal to x by L and y star equal to y by L. But uh, we are, uh, are we taking the same length in both cases? Okay. 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 See, the question asked by one of the participants is that for x star and y star, we have non dimensionalized it by one of the characteristic lengths L. See, it does not matter what dimension I take. What I mean here when I say characteristic length, 1 for x, 1 for y, I cannot take. I have to take one engineering dimension which I know. That is, for, for example, flow or a flat plate, it is length of the pipe, length of the plate. If it is flow inside a pipe, it is circular circular diameter. So, these are the characteristic lengths one I, one I would take. For example, square pipe, you would take the dimension of the square. So, no matter whether you are in x and y, when you are non dimensionalizing, you have to non dimensionalize with one dimension that to a known dimension, and that dimension can be only diameter length or the dimension of the square pipe. So, that answers your question both in the x momentum x momentum equation and in the energy equation we are taking a, a term for the body forces so we are already we are accounting for the pressure and uh, normal stresses and uh, uh, what else we are expecting actually the is that the coriolis forces or something else yes. okay the question Over to you, sir. Yeah. the question asked is we are already taking surface forces pressure forces and uh, the pressure surface forces, pressure forces, what is the additional thing which this body force is going to give? Body force is a new force. That is, you see when I take a simple circular pipe when flow is taking place, is there Coriolis force? No. So, there is no body force, but at the same time if I take a pipe which is rotating, when should I take a pipe rotating? A gas turbine blade cooling passage. A gas turbine blade cooling passage would be rotating. So, then there will be Coriolis force in case of a pipe which is rotating which will simulate a gas turbine blade cooling passage, that is one way or otherwise there can be a passage let us say in a furnace or in a furnace, when I say furnace with, let us say that is an induction furnace, that means what there might be electromagnetic force. So, there are special situations where in which these body forces either centrifugal force or Coriolis force or electromagnetic force which come into picture. It can be electrostatic force also. So, these forces generally if I take a flow in a pipe, they are not important, but if they are rotating or in the presence of electromagnetic force, then they become important. So, only when they are there and they become important, we take them into account in our Navier-Stokes equations. PSG College Coimbatore, any questions please? Sir, what do you mean by cryogenic heat transfer? Okay. There is one of the questions by the participant is what do you mean by cryogenic heat transfer? Cryogenic heat transfer is nothing but the heat transfer at low temperatures. Generally what we take into account, generally what we take into account is or at room temperatures or higher temperatures. 
but cryogenic temperatures are usually lower than the ambient temperature, much lower than 0 degree Celsius. They talk about 250, 280 Kelvin. So, we cannot, we cannot, uh, we usually do not come across those temperatures. Those temperatures which are much, much below the room temperature, but higher than our absolute 0 that is minus 273.15 degree Celsius uh, is the cryogenic heat transfer. Okay, can you give some examples, sir? Commonly used cryogens. No, cryogenic commonly we do not, uh, the common question asked is what are the commonly used cryogenic uh, applications? Okay. So, commonly used cryogenics is that if you take any sensor, they are not commonly used of course. If you take any sensor for example, thermal camera or FTIR spectrometer, usually we pour either liquid nitrogen. So, that is actually liquid nitrogen is sitting at very low temperatures. I do not recollect exact temperatures, but I very well know that it is very much lower than atmospheric that is at least 100 degree Celsius lower than atmospheric. So, the point is the in regularly for cooling for all sophisticated sensors, maybe it is thermal camera or FTIR spectrometer or any other costly equipment which requires local cooling, it has cryogenic temperature involved. In fact, Stirling cycle operated cryo, cryo, what is the cryo coolers are embedded in the sensors. Sir, uh, nasal number correlation is uh, non-dimensionalized nasal number correlation is arrived based on number of uh, assumptions. Uh, starts from uh, steady incompressible uh, laminar without discuss dissipation and all. But uh, it is uh, nasal number correlation is available for all uh, for many cases, <coughs> first doubt is uh, <coughs> Navier Stokes is capable to represent uh, turbulent also. Then uh, why it is restricted only to laminar? Okay. The question asked is actually the Nusselt number has only Reynolds and Prandtl number, but it starts with lot of assumptions that it is valid only for steady flow, incompressible flow. But Navier Stokes we have used uh, can be used. For is it, why is it Navier Stokes restricted only for laminar flows? The answer is Navier Stokes equations is not restricted for laminar flows. That is the answer, first of all. Let me write. See, if we see, if we see the Navier Stokes equation, we took the Navier Stokes equation, we took the Navier Stokes equation and did the Reynolds averaging, Reynolds averaging, and these Reynolds averaged equations are valid for turbulent flows. This is one way of looking at it, but the Navier-Stokes equations in general are valid for both laminar and turbulent. So, if I have to capture very small uh, turbulences, I have to march with time, but if I take steady state, it becomes difficult to capture turbulence. So, that is why we take the Reynolds averaged equations. So, answer is in spite of making the assumption that it is for steady flow in for steady flow and incompressible, we are going to, we are, we are able to get the solutions of the Navier-Stokes equation. That is, what is the solutions of the Navier-Stokes equation? That is friction factor as a function of Re. And energy equation, Nusselt number is a function of Re and Pr. But for compressible flows, if you have to take, then what will happen? Nusselt number will not only be a function of Reynolds and Prandtl but also a function of a Kirk number. Why? We have seen when we non-dimensionalized for compressible flows, new non-dimensionalized number which comes into picture is a Kirk number. So, we cannot say that this uh, non-dimensionalization is done only for steady and incompressible. We have done for compressible also. For compressible flow, new non-dimensional number which has to be taken into account is a Kirk number. That we regularly do not do, but if we see uh, compressible flows, Eckert number comes into picture.